because it all happened in Susa. Chapter 1 There once was a king, Achashverosh by name, who ruled most of the world, and he, of great fame, was having a party for friends far and near, with feasting and drinking for about half a year. Then for seven days more in his glorious palace he let every guest drink, from whatever chalice that each guest might prefer, gold, brass, silver, or tin. It was a rapturous state Achashverosh was in. The king had a wife, Queen Vashti by name, and she made a party for her girlfriends the same. They were eating and drinking and singing and dancing, when up to the door came a messenger prancing. The king doth request, he said with a bow, that Queen Vashti will come to the king's party now, in her radiant beauty and the royal gold crown. I think rather not, Vashti said with a frown. The message came back to the king, and he burned with anger, and to his advisers he turned. What shall we do to a queen who refuses to obey her husband? Of all the abuses, this is the worst. The advisers chimed in. Oh, king, we agree, it's a terrible sin. If all of our women begin to act out, where will it all lead? A rebellion, no doubt. The king needs a new wife. Let Vashti retire, and send out a decree that will inspire the women of Persia to obey their men. So the king got some paper, his seal, and a pen, and he wrote this decree in French, Spanish, and Greek, and sent out his couriers that very week. Vashti was opposed, and each man held sway. In his own home, his wife would obey. Chapter 2 Soon Achashverosh found himself lonely. He thought only of Vashti. If only, if only. But his advisers said, King, do not worry. We'll find a new wife, slapdash in a hurry. The most beautiful girls in the country will bring to set on display before you, my king. The idea pleased the king, so again a decree went out to the people of every degree. Now a Jew lived in Susa, Mordechai by name of the tribe of Benjamin, and his claim to fame was taking care of Esther, his beautiful niece, a charming young lady with parents deceased. Now Mordechai heard of the king's request, so he sent Esther off. He thought it was best. He did not sit and wonder, what for? He would have the king for a nephew-in-law. But one thing he told Esther to do, never tell anyone you are a Jew. She gained favor with Haggai, the keeper of women. Each night in a bathtub of perfume she's swimming. After twelve months of aloes and oils and ointment, she was all gussied up for the king's appointment. When the king finally saw her, his heart did flutter. Her skin was like milk. Her legs were like butter. He cried, She's the one! And he crowned her as queen. They had the biggest party Persia had seen. The king gave gifts and rolled back the taxes. The people were shocked, fell flat on their backs. And just when Esther's position was hot, Mordechai discovered a terrible plot. Big Thana and Teresh, those two evil spies, were overheard plotting Achashverosh's demise. Mordechai straightway to Esther went, and she further word to Achashverosh sent. And so Achashverosh found to be true the report of the plot. So what did he do? He set up the gallows and strung up those crooks, and the scribe wrote it down in the king's records books. Chapter 3 Achashverosh's advisor, Haman by name, descended from Agag, who, to King Saul's shame, was slain by Samuel by God's command. Still Agag had descendants. That was Satan's plan. Now everyone bowed when Haman walked by, except for that Jew, righteous Mordechai. This made Haman mad, and he, he began to choose. Would he kill Mordechai or all of the Jews? With wicked scheming he made a plot, and in the month of Nisan they cast the lot. From month to month, time wasn't far, he would kill all the Jews in the month of Adar. Haman went to the king and told him some lies. He said, Mighty king, do you think it wise? A people so different who keep none of your laws. Should we tolerate them in your kingdom? Because they are of no help to this country, my boy. I'll give ten million dollars if you will them destroy. The king said, No problem, and gave Haman his ring. Write out a decree. Seal it up with this thing. Every Jew in the provinces you may destroy. Every man, every woman, every girl, every boy. The king's couriers and horses went out that day, and all of Susa sat down in dismay. Chapter 4 
When Mordechai heard what Haman had written, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, sat in ashes, smitten. His wailing was loud till it reached the king's gate. Esther did not know what had happened of late. She sent clothes to her uncle. He should properly dress. And her servant brought back Morty's cause of distress. All Jews are in danger. There's no turning back. You must go to the king to prevent this attack. Then Esther made known to Mordechai, to go to the king means I surely will die. The king takes no callers, kills all, I am told, unless he extends his scepter of gold. Please, Esther, my dear, replied Mordecai, do not think in the palace that you will not die. We need intercession to stop Haman's crime. You were placed in the palace for just such a time. Then Esther said bravely, The law I will break, I will go to the king for my people's sake. All Jews of Susa can aid in this fight. Please fast, take no food, for three days and three nights, after which I will go appeal to the crown. For the sake of my people, I will lay my life down. Chapter 5 Now the truth's always shown on the third day. Esther got dressed and went on her way, through the king's gateway and into his court. An audience with the king was what she sought. And when the king saw her, he said, Do not fear, he held out his scepter, and Esther drew near. Dear Esther, he cried, what an excellent thing. Come, you can have what you want up to half my kingdom. Esther demurred and said with a smile, Let the king and Haman come to my place for a while. With roast leg of lamb and baklava sweet, I'll cook up a scrumptious supper to eat. The king and Haman did go to dine, and the king asked again while drinking his wine, I know, Esther, dear, you want something more. Just ask, for half of my kingdom is yours. If I have found favor in the king's sight, please come for supper tomorrow night. Even then my request will be made known. Be sure to bring Haman, don't come alone. Oh, Haman was honored. His spirit did fly. He was high as a kite till he saw Mordechai, that righteous Jew who would not bow low. Haman stopped home to his wife he did go. Ah, oh, Zeresh, he cried. I have so many riches. Children, promotions, all of my wishes. Yet still I am sad. I am unhappy and blue whenever I see Mordechai the Jew. Let a gallows be built, Zeresh suggested. Why should my Haman thus be bested? Tomorrow you can ask the king and get his permission for Morty's hanging. Chapter 6 That night Ahasuerus could not sleep. He tried drinking warm milk. He tried counting sheep. He thought he would read some, or rather be read to. The scribes brought the annals of his reign to his bed to read of the marvelous things he had done. But a story arose. Indeed, t'was a strange one. Big Thana and Teresh had plotted to kill the king without warning, and Mordechai still had not been rewarded for this great deed. We must fix this omission, said the king, with great speed. Who is out in the courtyard? What early riser? Why, look, it's Haman, the king's adviser. Both men were thinking of Mordechai, the king to give honor, but Haman to die. Well, Haman, please tell me what should the king do? for a servant most faithful and most helpful, too. And Haman thought to himself with glee, Of whom does a king speak? Ha, <laughs> ha, certainly me. O king, get the best horse upon which the king rides, and put the king's robes on that man besides. Let him go through the streets, led by a servant upright, calling, This is the man in whom the king doth delight. Grand, said the king, this you will do. Go now and honor Mordechai the Jew. So Haman took the king's robes and his horse. He did all to Mordechai, as the king ordered, of course. But Haman came home, ashamed to his wife. I have never been so embarrassed in all of my life. Then Zeresh, his wife, said to Haman, Oh my, your downfall's begun before Mordechai. Don't fight against him, you surely will lose, for Mordechai is of the seed of the Jews. So agreed Haman's wife and all of his men as Haman went off to Esther's again. Chapter 7 Again Haman and the king were at Esther's meal, and the king asked Esther, Really, how do you feel? I know there is more you are wanting to say. O king, let me have my life this day. All my people are sold to the arms of murder. If it were only slavery, I'd say nothing further. What? cried the king. He arose from his seat. Who dares to perform this treacherous feat? This wicked Haman is our enemy. 
and Haman found himself weak in the knees, the king stomped out into the garden, and Haman begged for Queen Esther's pardon. He had thrown himself in Esther's direction. The king mistook it for inordinate affection. Haman, you're finished, the king cried in reproof. Will you assault the queen under my roof? The servants came in and covered Haman's head, and on Mordechai's gallows, Haman hung dead. Chapter 8 So Esther was given all of Haman's things, and the king gave Mordechai his special ring. But the trial itself still wasn't finished, because Haman's decree could not be diminished. The law of the land in those days demanded the king could not rescind what the king had commanded. So Mordechai wrote a different decree, that in the king's name the Jews would be free to defend themselves on the day before the established date of the impending war. All of those who had tried to attack the Jews would find that the Jews would fight back. This fourth decree was carried again to all the king's provinces, to all women and men, and Mordechai became the king's advisor. Clearly beyond Haman, he was so much wiser. When the people of the land heard the good news, saw the joy and the honor, they too became Jews. Chapter 9 but the Purim battle had yet to be won. On the thirteenth of Adar, they gathered each one of the Jews in each province they would defend, all of their people, to the bitter end. Their enemies thought they would have victory, but today was a day of topsy-turvy. The fear of the Jews fell on their enemies, even the rulers fell to their knees. And Mordechai's fame had spread throughout the land. The Jews slew their enemies with sword in hand. They killed five hundred in Susa when the battle began and they also destroyed the ten sons of Haman. Parshendata Dalphon, Aspata Porata, Adalia Aridata, Parmashta Arisai, Aridai Bazata, they're all done away, and the Jews had a great time of feasting next day. And Mordechai wrote to every land to celebrate Purim, so by his command, each year at this time we tell this tale of Haman's plot, which was destined to fail, how he cast the lot, we say poor in Hebrew, they called it Purim, just like we do. The story of Esther, who went to the king at the request of her uncle, and his encouraging. Of the letter they wrote to all the Jews, saying, Keep this holiday, remember this news. Teach your children throughout your generations. Each year at this time, have a celebration. Chapter 10 now Ahasuerus's number two man is Mordechai instead of Haman. Mordechai became great in name and deed, sought the good of his people, and spoke peace to his seed. There's no chapter 11, but there is something more. If you read through this book, something's missing, for sure. For the name of our God is not clearly written, but Esther's name means, myself I have hidden. If it seem Yahweh's absent, because you don't hear his name, I promise you, children, he is there just the same. Little children fear not, try to be wise. Help for God's people will always arise.